it's 11.46, so I think we should make a start with session two. So we've got the first paper in this session is by, by uh, Diana Batchelor. So Dr. Diana Batchelor is an e ESRC postdoctoral research fellow at the Centre for Criminology at the University of Oxford. She conducts research on victim survivor perspectives of crime and justice. She focuses particularly on victims' expectations and experiences of communication with the people who committed offences against them. So, Diana, if you're ready to share your screen, are you? I can see you're there. I am here. I will just briefly say hello. I quite like everybody else introducing themselves, so you know who's talking. But I will disappear once I share my screen. I would like to tell you about the answer to this question uh, from the crime survey. Uh, some of you might be surprised it's possible to even look at whether um, victims are willing to meet the offender um, from the crime survey, but there's some interesting questions in there which I will tell you about in detail. And um, as per the introduction, I'm looking really in terms of victim perspectives on justice generally, and particularly on whether and when they choose to meet the offender, usually under the umbrella of restorative justice, um, which means different things to different people. Um, but I am talking here specifically about um, meetings, dialogue between victims and offenders after the offence, um, and at different stages during the justice process. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with the kind of process, um, but it's taking place within the criminal justice system at different stages. Um, in the UK, most analyze it, um, yeah, which vary in success and funding. Um, so why do we, why is the specific relationship between the severity of the crime and victim's choice to meet the offender important? Um, well, this general um, support for restorative justice tends to depend on the severity of the offence, with most people assuming that um, it might be only appropriate for victims of minor offences, basically. Um, that's the general public opinion, and in fact, translates into policy and practice as well. So you often find um, criminal justice agencies offering restorative justice more often to victims of minor crimes and less frequently to victims of serious crimes. And that's an issue if um, at least some of the benefits that there have been shown to be from restorative justice you know, the, the, so there's been lots of studies showing that there are benefits for victims. And if even a proportion, small proportion of these benefits are in fact the case, um, then denying victims of serious offences the opportunity to get involved is potentially denying them um, the opportunity to really recover and build resilience um, and increase their well-being. Um, there are some studies on the relationship between the severity of the crime and victims' willingness to meet the offender. Um, most of them suggest that this relationship is negative. Um, as you might imagine, the measuring severity is difficult, and so there are different ways in which this has been done. Quite a few different studies um, show that both in hypothetical situations and in real life, victims of more serious crimes are less likely to want to participate. However, there's also um, quite a few studies finding no relationship at all, including an um, analysis of the British Crime Survey as it was then in 2000, um, just that, that there was no difference between those who had experienced minor and serious offences regarding whether they would want to meet the offender. Um, also in hypothetical scenarios, um, which can obviously delve often quite in more depth into the specifics of the crime, but then they're perhaps less ecologically valid. Um, and there's even a few studies suggesting that the relationship might be positive. Um, in particular, this Zebel and his colleagues in 2017, this is probably the most robust quantitative study on the issue. Um, they had three different measures of severity, uh, and one of them um, 
two had no effect at all, and but one of them, which was the harmfulness of the offence, um, did appear to have a positive relationship on whether the willingness victims were willing to take part. So this quite strange landscape of previous literature um, led me to hypothesise that perhaps it is a non-linear relationship um, because it seemed um, that maybe at the lower end the relationship was positive and at the upper end of severity the relationship might be negative um, and there are some indications from qualitative studies that might be the case for example victims who didn't part want to meet the offender some saying it's not serious enough and others saying it's too serious um, so this was kind of my idea of what might be in fact going on and I set out to test it using the crime survey. So I used a method which I actually would be interested um, to hear people's thoughts on, um, because as we, my impression of the crime survey when I first started it, there's, there's so many different variables, you can plug them in any way you want, and you can almost always find something positive that looks interesting. And obviously there's a move um, within social sciences in general to have more open and transparent methods um, and so I was keen to pre-register a study because I found found some effects using the data from 2015 to 2017 and then wanted to pre-register that a rep, an effectively a replication of the study first part of the study um, so that I couldn't change it and tweak things to find positive results just because I liked the look of them um, and I think that was quite successful because what I basically found was that some of the effects I identified in the first study um, replicated and others didn't, um, and I didn't have the ability to fiddle around and, and change that. So, I, But um, yeah, I think pre-registration of secondary data analysis is fairly rare, um, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. So the question in the crime survey, um, you may know, Victims who, people who are victimized are then asked in the victim module, um, it's explained this way, victims are sometimes offered the chance by the police or other criminal justice agencies to meet the offender in the presence of someone else, to ask the offender why they committed the offense and how to say how it made them feel. And then there's a series of questions about um, whether they were given the opportunity at the time. And if they weren't, they were asked the hypothetical question really, would you have accepted this offer if it had been made to you at the time? And that is the dependent variable on all of my studies. Um, and there's three separate elements to each. So this was, all of these were included in both study one and two. So um, the influence of overall severity, so you will probably know the one to 20 severity measure in the study and that effect on willingness to meet the offender. Then I looked in more depth at some potential sub dimensions of severity, other measures of severity. So the impact and whether or not the offense was violent. And then I just dipped my toe in, in terms of psychological explanations for these relationships, because in actual fact, um, the measures in the survey don't really allow you to go in much depth on that, but um, I still think there's some interesting findings. Um, so the first exploratory study I did using two years of the data suggested that indeed my hypothesis that there is a curvilinear relationship was correct. Um, and if you do um, enter the quadratic, so sorry, so I should say what I've done. This is a general additive model. Um, which looks at all different types of curvilinear relationships. I hypothesized that it was a curve, an sort of N-shaped curve. If you add a quadratic term, that was in fact significant, um, but there's lots of advice that actually that overestimates whether there um, is indeed a rise at the beginning and a fall at the end. And so a two lines analysis, which is a simple, simply um, a piecewise logistic regression that estimates a break point in this, this slope and tests whether there's a difference in the slope before and after the break point. And indeed, in study one, all of that indicated that it rises in the lower end of um, seriousness scale and falls off at the end. However, when I 
repeated this using the other three years of the survey. Um, I did not find that there was no break point. Um, the, the quadratic term was not significant. And as you can see, this is what it looked like. Um, so sort of a straight line, but also it was not um, a linear predictor of willingness to meet. So as because as you can see, this is a, a very gentle slope, actually. So um, in conclusion, the answer was, did, did I find any kind of relationship between the overall severity and willingness to meet? No. And yet I proceeded to look at some of the other dimensions because from the exploratory study um, that suggested that violence, so just the binary measure of whether the victim said that the offence had included the threat of force or violence, reduced people's willingness to participate and impact, um, which I added together this impact scale, um, I capped it at three, increased people's willingness. And um, in both studies, this was true. This was a pattern across. Um, this is just one of, so I entered them into a logistic regression with a lot of control variables that could be relevant. Um, and found indeed that that was the case basically, that um, yeah, violent offences were associated with fewer people wanting to meet the offender and the greater the impact, the more likely people were to want to meet the offender. So this is an interesting finding because obviously, usually violence and impact increase together. So the fact that they have an opposite effect on people's willingness to participate um, tells us a few things about what's going on, which I'll talk about later. So I then wanted to just explore these particular relationships in more detail. Um, there are kind of lay theories that hadn't been tested either way, that perhaps, you know, this the negative relationship from violence could be because people are more afraid of the offender and then obviously less likely to want to meet them. Um, or it could be the exact other way around that um, when the victim is afraid they do want to meet the offender in order to kind of reduce that negative emotion and so there was I had a kind of bi-directional hypotheses for these three factors um, and I added them into a path model that looked like this to understand whether they were mediators of the relation the negative relationship from violence to willingness to meet or potentially mediators from the positive relationship between impact and willingness to meet um, and the, the they were um, but in this way which I shall talk about so the criminal justice response so this was a measure of whether the police had identified the offender and taken action unfortunately there wasn't enough um, there weren't enough people where the police had taken action to then break that down further and look at the mediation effect. But it's just a general indicator of whether justice had been served really from the victim's perspective. And this actually did explain, so obviously with a cross-sectional study, um, we've got to talk about causality um, quite carefully, but this was a mediator between violence and willingness to meet. So the more violent the offence, the more likely action had been taken by the police and the less likely the victim therefore was to meet with the offender. Um, perhaps surprisingly, because you might imagine that when the police have taken action, the offender has been identified and secured, put in prison. So it's all much, much more possible. And yet it was the opposite way around um, than you might have thought on that basis. And then the role of emotions um, seem to be as positive mediators between impact and willingness to meet. So the greater the impact of the crime, the more likely the victim was to say they had felt anger. And um, I picked lose to lose confidence as the kind of mildest measure of fear um, because that was most all encompassing and the victims who said they lost confidence tended to also say they felt fear or anxiety and some of the other measures in the survey um, and both of those were positive predictors of willingness to meet so again somewhat counterintuitively I think most of the theories would assume that 
Um, anger would mean hostility towards the offender and that someone wouldn't want to meet with them. But in fact, victims perhaps were seeing the opportunity to meet with the offender as a way to express their anger and reduce it. And similarly with fear, um, that was making people more likely to want to um, meet the offender. And um, just finally, I've rushed through that a bit, but I'd be interested if yeah people have comments and questions. So the important thing for where I started at the beginning is that there's certainly no evidence of a negative relationship between severity of the crime and willingness to meet. So the idea that we could be not offering restorative justice to victims of serious crimes on the basis that they wouldn't want to anyway just has no basis whatsoever. Um, of course, people, you may want to exclude victims of certain crimes for other reasons, um, but this kind of lazy excuse, which is I'm, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to them about it because they probably wouldn't want to, is not acceptable. Um, and there are other studies. So this Van Camp and Wemmer study from 2016 talks about that the restorative justice offer should be proactive, um, and that victims who are offered it say they appreciate being offered it, even if they don't want to take part, there weren't any negative effects associated with being offered it. Um, and so this finding really aligns with that. Um, there, obviously, from my look at the overall severity, I didn't find a positive relationship either. But I think the counterintuitive findings that um, impact specifically was likely to make people more willing to meet the offender. Um, and the anger and fear actually, again, increased people's willingness to make to meet the offender. What all, that, all of that suggests is that, firstly, somebody from the outside can't predict what victims will want to do and won't want to do. So the idea that justice professionals, friends, family, well-meaning people can predict whether a victim want to meet the offender or not, um, is not true because we're making what turn out to be quite biased assumptions, I think. And um, oh, the victim is too afraid, um, they'll never want to meet the offender. In fact, um, from my qualitative research, I've also interviewed victims who do meet the offender. And for many of them, overcoming a sense of fear was really important motivator. So that fits with this um, in terms of the findings. And, um, yeah, I'm going to end there because the basic, unfortunately, I would have liked to say, oh, well, the, these are the very clear predictors. And that means we can create these exclusion criteria for who we shouldn't and shouldn't should and shouldn't offer RJ to. Um, but in actual fact, I think my findings suggest we can't assume anything. And in an ideal world, all victims would be offered it. Um, and in fact, if you do need to create any kind of exclusion criteria for resource, constraints um probably the people who experience no impact and no emotions um as a result of the crime are the people to um exclude rather than the people at the serious end of the scale um and i will leave it there we will move on now to uh, the next speaker is lucy bryant so lucy's speaking on the inequalities in victimization Lucy is a research and policy officer for the Institute of Alcohol Studies in London, currently studying for a PhD in social policy at the London School for Economics. So uh, Lucy, I'll hand over to you to present your slides. Thank you. OK, I'll just share my screen. OK, thank you so much. Yeah, I am presenting uh, some of the findings from a, a kind of bigger programme of work that uh, myself and Dr. Carly Lighthouse have been undertaking, um, looking at how um, victimization um, from alcohol-related antisocial behaviour and, and, and alcohol-related violence is distributed across different socioeconomic groups in England and Wales. So I'm going to focus on our ASB findings today, but I will give some of our violence findings for some context as well. And obviously, I'm happy to chat about either if anybody's interested. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to say um, that our 
collaboration was um, awarded a commendation from the ONS Research Excellent Awards last year. Uh, and following this, we've already got plans uh, to take our findings forward and try and look at some of the drivers that might be behind these big inequalities that, that we found, particularly thinking about um, off-trade alcohol availability, so uh, supermarket and off-license sales, and kind of where those patterns and how they maybe map on, on these violence and other victimization patterns we've, we've come across. So um, one of the kind of most common findings in alcohol harm research it is one of inequality. So there is a particularly prominent finding often referred to as alcohol harm paradox, which is the fact that despite lower socioeconomic groups drinking less on average than others, uh, this is the group that experiences the highest degree of alcohol related mortality and morbidity. And this and other findings like it really got us thinking, well, what about social harms? What about things like violence and ASB that we, we know are really strongly connected to, 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 to alcohol? Uh, so we've used the crime survey to investigate that over the last couple of years. And our, our first findings were around violence. And we did find really big inequalities mirroring what was what's already been presented in health harms. So we found that those in the lower socioeconomic groups experience higher prevalence of alcohol related violence overall and actually kind of what's behind that is really much higher incidence and prevalence rates for alcohol related domestic and acquaintance violence specifically uh, so this isn't really about violence in the nighttime economy violence um, committed by strangers uh, and these gaps were really quite big as well uh, so for example we found that the most deprived groups um, could experience as much as 14 times as many incidents of alcohol-related domestic violence every year when compared to the, to the least deprived. So these findings were, were really troubling and um, we, we went on to try and understand was, was, was there any kind of known risk factors for violence other than um, this SES driver that could be explaining these patterns. So we, uh, we looked at this and we um, included risk factors like um, gender, age, uh, whether or not victims had a disability, how often they were attending uh, nighttime economy spaces as well. And generally the, the patterns held. So we, we did find that um, SES was a risk factor for alcohol related violence overall. Uh, and the same was true for the domestic and the acquaintance violence. Uh, and, and there wasn't really much of a pattern going on in stranger violence. So that they were our first kind of violence findings. But we also know that um, alcohol is associated with some antisocial behavior. And, and while antisocial behavior is maybe more um, kind of a subjective experience than, than something that can be kind of defined um, as a violent crime, um, that doesn't mean it's any less impactful necessarily. So there's a lot of survey and focus group work uh, that gives us some insight into this, including how antisocial behavior can actually affect people's sense of safety um, and, and shape where they choose to live uh, or spend their time. Uh, we also know that there, there might be ways that these experiences kind of intersect with other inequalities. So, uh, having your sleep disrupted due to someone's drinking has been linked to deprivation uh, and given what we what we know already about how alcohol harm is uneven what i mentioned about the health harms and then our own violence findings we thought this is another area where it's important we kind of we kind of look at how these experiences are spread so we use the crime survey for england and wales as i mentioned and these are the items we drew upon um, as you can see we use three different ses measures um, we actually repeated our analysis um, three times with a different measure each time. Uh, we did this to kind of uh, counteract any limitation that one measure might have. If we were seeing the same picture with all three measures, we could kind of trust what we were finding and, and, and not worry that it was necessarily a, a kind of a hangover from, from one of the measures. Uh, we included the same risk factors as we did when we looked at violence. 
Um, and we used items around ASB that asked people whether they had or hadn't experienced it in the last year, alcohol related ASB that is, and items that asked how often they'd experienced it if they had. Um, and there was a huge range of timeframes available and we turned it into kind of a binary weekly uh, or more or less than weekly. So the first thing we did uh, was create prevalence and frequency rates using those two items I just mentioned. And the next step, which we are currently working on, is a similar regression analysis um, using those extra risk factors. So when I present these patterns, I'm going to show you, we're then going to kind of look at what else is going on and what else might be explaining them so, so we know how to kind of move forward from that. We actually used five waves of prime survey data, and that was simply because by the time we are kind of cutting everything by uh, SES and then by all these other risk factors, you're getting down to quite small numbers of people. Um, so that's that's why we we've done we've done that, and it worked really well in the violence work. So that's a positive. So here are here are the first results. So this is asking people whether they experienced this alcohol-related antisocial behaviour in the last year. Uh, and as you can see, it's it's a pretty even spread. There are no big differences between uh, the lowest and the highest SES groups. There's no particular pattern across all the different SES measures. You know, just under one in ten for almost uh, any any group you want to look at. And this is quite different from what we saw with violence. Um, and you know, we we saw this and we're thinking, okay, maybe this is this is kind of a different picture. Maybe we haven't got this, this kind of big inequality quite the same way we do with violence. Um, but then we moved on to look at the frequency. So these people who reported um, ever experiencing this ASB in the last year, uh, they then reported how often they had experienced this alcohol-related ASB. And this is where we see really big uh, differences. So. Amongst those um, victims of alcohol-related antisocial behaviour, it's those from the lowest economic groups that are most likely to experience this with high frequency, where high frequency means at least weekly. Uh, and as you can see, um, the proportions are, are really quite stark now. It's, it's, it's quite different. So for, for measuring your SES by your occupation or your housing, um, those um, in the lowest SES groups by those measures, more than half of the ASB victims here had experienced alcohol-related ASB at least weekly throughout the whole year. So this is really quite a qualitatively different experience um, to many of those in the, in the higher SES groups. And I think that's something we need to really pay attention to, especially when we're talking about effects of, of, of ASB that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, around feelings of personal safety uh, and physical effects like your sleep, um, particularly as um, we might think about these, um, these are obviously individuals reporting these, but if these are things that are occurring when someone's in their home, there might be children that are caught up in, in these kind of experiences as well, especially if the kind of ASB is like noise outside and things like that. So this the, these gaps were, were really quite stark and really worrying to see. Um, here it is graphically. So this is your um, when SES is measured by, by income, uh, by uh, home ownership and by occupation. Uh, so we, we're again, we're seeing this same, um, this same shape that we saw when, with, the, with the violence findings earlier. Uh, all of these findings together, I think, have, have led us to kind of consider uh, some of the policy implications that might come out of them. Um, it's really positive that the violence findings have already been raised um, in some of the debates around the domestic abuse bill um, and kind of thinking about the role alcohol might play and thinking about, you know, approaches to that kind of violence and how that might be, might be different. Um, we also uh, are really interested in, in the potential that uh, pricing and availability interventions around alcohol might have to kind of close some of these gaps. So there's already a kind of wealth of research that suggests that raising the price of alcohol and reducing both kind of the physical and the temporal availability of alcohol are going to pull levels of violence down. Uh, and really interestingly, 
Uh, we know that minimum unit pricing has been modelled to actually improve health outcomes for the lowest SES groups to a greater degree than any other group. So there's potential that the same might be true around these kind of social harms, and that's something we think is really pressing to, to investigate. And we also think that this might kind of give us cause to reflect on wider criminal justice approaches to this kind of alcohol-related violence and, and, and harm, uh, particularly as I think our findings really suggest there's something structural um, going on here, that there, there's structural drivers behind this violence that maybe kind of um, approaches to policing of alcohol violence that we've seen before, like um, policing in the nighttime economy and, and focusing on individual uh, people or premises might be not necessarily the most kind of impactful route and actually thinking about um, these measures like pricing and availability might yield much better results especially if we're talking about violence in the home that's often not reported and that you know traditional policing approaches might find uh, might struggle to kind of get at um, I think although pricing and availability interventions are often thought of as kind of national level policy, and they certainly are often implemented that way, they can be done at the local level as well and with the support of police forces. So there are routes through the licensing system that can get these things in place, like the reducing the strength scheme that's been really positive in some areas in Suffolk, which kind of took the cheapest, most high strength alcohol off the shelves in, in off-trade premises. Uh, I also wanted to take this opportunity to kind of uh, use the, the wisdom of the room, I suppose. Um, we're uh, using these antisocial behaviour survey items for the first time. And obviously the format's slightly different to the violence um, items in the survey. Uh, that's why instead of making kind of a more traditional incidence rate, we made this uh, frequency measure that, that, I, that I presented. Um, but I wonder if anyone has more experience with these um, survey items and whether there's any other considerations we should keep in mind as we finish off our analysis. And then finally, I, we've also been reflecting a bit more about the, about the terminology. Um, we're, we're really aware that ASB obviously has kind of a political history and it is one tied up with uh, the stigmatization of lower SES groups and young people. And as this work is, you know, trying to kind of uh, address these socioeconomic inequalities in these really kind of uh, impactful experiences, uh, we're just really aware it would be unfortunate for it to kind of feed back into that and, and, and contribute to that stigmatization more, even though we're talking about we're talking about victimization, obviously, not perpetration. Um, but we're, we're aware there's kind of new political interest around ASB um, incidents, so it might be kind of on policymakers' minds. And that's made us think about whether we ought to kind of frame our findings slightly differently uh, in terms of the terminology we're using. Obviously, when we're talking about survey items, uh, we're, we'll, we're using the wording that, that's there, um, but whether kind of these findings should be presented um, uh, in, a, in a way that's kind of separated from that so something around maybe kind of you know environmental well-being or something like that I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that but I'd be really interested to hear it um, and yeah any insight anyone has would be really appreciated um, yeah so that's everything these are the papers if you'd like to read them and that, like I said I'm happy to chat about any of this work uh, now or later thank you so our next presentation, our next speaker is Nadia Butler. Um, Nadia is an early career researcher from Public Health Institute, Liverpool John Moores University. Um, her research interests are in interpersonal violence and particularly um, violence against children. She undertakes original research, um, including population survey analysis, systemic systematic reviews and data synthesis and program evaluation studies and works on local, national and international research projects, including work conducted as part of the WHO Collaborating um, Centre for Violence Prevention. So uh, Nadia, if you want to just say hello and get your slides up, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you very much, Catherine. I'll just see if I can share. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much.
Um, okay, so my name is Nadia Butler. I'm a public health researcher at Liverpool John Morris University. Um, and this is a study um, um, I did with my colleagues, Professor Zara Quigg, also at John Morris, and Professor Mark Ballas um, at Public Health Wales. Um, and we were looking at um, the association between childhood abuse and risk of re-victimisation as an adult um, using the Crown Survey for England and Wales. Um, so just briefly, just a bit of background. Um, so interpersonal violence is a major public health issue. Um, it claims over 1.3 li million lives globally each year. Um, but actually non-fatal forms of violence are even more prevalent than homicide um, and have serious consequences for lifelong health and well-being. So for example, 35% of women um, are estimated globally to experience either physical and or sexual inter intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. Um, and addressing the physical and mental health consequences of non-fatal violence um, can impose substantial burdens and costs on health services. Um, so for the year 2015-16, the estimated cost of non-fatal interpersonal violence to the NHS and other healthcare providers um, in England and Wales was over 1.8 billion. Um, so interpersonal violence is very high individual um, societal health service costs and represents an important health, public health issue. Um, but an improved understanding um, of the associated risk factors um, is actually crucial to informing inter effective intervention strategies to prevent, reduce and respond to interpersonal violence. Um, but using a life course approach um, or perspective, there's actually evidence to support the concept of re-victimization. And that is that individuals who experience victimization in childhood are at increased risk of a range of adverse outcomes um, across the life course, including violence re-victimization as an adult. But historically, actually, much of the focus of research was on outcomes associated with um, child abuse in isolation, individual types of child abuse, I should say, sorry, in isolation. Um, so a review of studies in 2001 um, found that only a very small minority of published work up to that point um, included consideration of more than one type of abuse. And early studies on re-victimization were similar, so they tended to focus on just one specific type of child abuse and its relationship with a particular, often similar form of victimization in adulthood. So, for example, you had studies looking at child sexual abuse on its own as a risk factor um, for increased risk um, of sexual assault in adulthood, or similarly, um, looking at exposure to domestic abuse as a child um, being associated with being a victim of domestic abuse as an adult and exposing um, future children to parental conflict also. Um, but this type of, or this body of research really implied that types of abuse occur individually. Um, however, more recent research has demonstrated that child abuse and other types of adversity in childhood typically co-occur. Um, and consequently, these type of studies, uh, which attribute risk of re-victimization to just one specific form of abuse, um, may actually be misleading. Um, and over the past two decades, there's now been increasing attention um, and has focused on the contribution of co-occurring adverse childhood experiences. Um, so looking at um, lots of different adversity um, together and their contribution to a host of poor outcomes across the life course. Um, so ACEs incorporate um, a range of stressful and potentially traumatic events during childhood that they directly affect the child. So they might be things like verbal, physical or sexual abuse or, or also may affect um, the environment in which they live. So things like domestic witnessing domestic violence or living with an adult um, with substance misuse issues or mental illness. Um, but critically, these studies have demonstrated that adversity in childhood can affect individuals right throughout their life. Um, they've been found to be one of the strongest predictors of poor outcomes throughout the life course. Um, so in areas like education, employment, health and well-being. Um, but relevant today, also a strong predictor um, of involvement in violence, either as a victim or as a perpetrator. Um, and the ACE studies have been useful and the, um, for the framework that they've kind of provided, um, this shared understanding um, of the impact of adversity on a wide range of public health outcomes. Um, and in a lot of countries, this has been instrumental in driving um, national policy changes around um, responding to adversity in childhood. 
Um, so one of the most crucial points or contributions of the ACE literature is about establishing that the quantity of stressors during childhood, so the ACE count um, as it's known, is an important predictor um, of many poor behavioural and health outcomes across the life course. Um, and these ACE studies demonstrate that adversity operates in an additive manner, um, whereby there's a positive relationship between exposure to higher numbers of ACEs and then increasing risk of a range of poor outcomes. Um, so this is findings from a national household survey in England that was done in 2013. Um, it looked at a range of different outcomes. I've just picked um, the violence-related ones here. Um, but you can see the incremental increase um, in the prevalence of both perpetration and victimization as the number of ACEs increase. Um, so 2% of people with no ACEs um, had experienced victimization in the past year. And this rose up to 16% with um, amongst those who had reported four or more ACEs. Um, these same relationships hold in multivariate analysis. Um, so compared to someone with no history of ACEs, someone with one ACE was 1.5 times more likely to have experienced violence in the last year, uh, four times more likely amongst those with two to three ACEs, and seven times more likely amongst those with four or more ACEs. Um, but in the UK, there's actually been a limited number of these types of studies that looked at the relationship between child abuse um, and specific types of adult interpersonal violence. Um, so they tended to just look at um, just being generally being a victim of violence in the past year. Um, there are some studies from the US uh, which, is, which suggest the same strong graded relationship between number of ACEs experienced um, and risk of being a victim of intimate partner violence or sexual violence. Um, However, they are limited because they use a non-representative um, healthcare sample. Um, so the rationale for the, the kind of the current and the aim of the current study. Um, so as I already said, um, previous research has tended to focus on violence in general rather than looking at specific types um, of violence in adulthood, or they've been limited by the use of non-representative specific samples like healthcare samples. Um, but crucially, they've typically tended to focus either on the cumulative burden of ACEs. So the ACE score provides this nice simple means of examining the impact of clustered adversities, um, but it risks oversimplification by not considering the impact of individual ACEs. Um, so it just talks about the number, it doesn't actually talk about whether there's differences between different types of ACEs on outcomes. Um, but then on the other hand, you have studies considering the individual ACEs, but omitting the impact of um, experiencing multiple forms of victimization. Um, and we know from the ACE studies um, that types of adversity are not only highly likely to co-occur, um, but they also demonstrate a cumulative risk on outcomes. Um, so the aim of our study was to, uh, the primary aim was to look at the association between being a victim of child abuse and then violence re-victimization in adulthood, but specifically looking at um, intimate partner violence, sexual violence and physical assault, um, and then using data from a nationally representative general population sample. Um, and then given to date that the study literature tends to be split between count and type, um, we considered the impact of both the type of abuse experience and also the number of types um, experienced on risk um, of re-victimization. Um, so we used data um, from the 2015-16 wave of the crime survey for England and Wales. Um, for that year, there was a total of around 35,000 surveys completed uh, with a response rate of 72%. Um, however, our sample for our study um, is um, adults aged 16 to 59 who completed the self-complete module that year. Um, so the total number of individuals in our study is around 22,000. Um, so for that that wave, that survey wave was the first time um, the crime survey incorporated um, a module of questions which asked adult respondents whether they'd experienced abuse as a child before the age of 16 years. Um, so measures in our study, we looked at uh, physical abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, um, and witnessing violence between parent, parents. Um, we also created a derived variable um, that summed the number of types of abuse someone had experienced, and then we categorized that as none, as having experienced a single type or multiple types. Um, demographics or covariates we included in our models were age, sex, ethnicity, and deprivation. 
And then, as I said, we looked at um, three types of violence victimization in adulthood, so after 16 years. Um, and that was intimate partner violence since age 16 years, sexual violence since age 16 years, um, and physical assault in the past 12 months. Um, we used SPSS, we also coded um, childhood abuse, um, anyone with missing data, uh, it was coded as a negative response, um, sort of in line with the previous ACE literature methodology. Um, and then we ran logistic regressions, um, which with each of the violence victimization um, variables as the dependent variable. And for each of these, we ran three models uh, for each violence outcome while controlling for sociodemographics. Um, so in model one, uh, we just included the sociodemographics and the child abuse count variable. In model two, we included all individual types of child abuse. And then in model three, we included both the child abuse count variable and also all the individual types of child abuse. Um, so in terms of the number of people who are reported experiencing um, abuse in childhood, 18.6% of our sample reported at least one form of abuse. Um, and this was made up of 10.6% uh, reporting a single type and 8% uh, reporting multiple or two or more types of abuse. Um, individual types of abuse, 9% reported psychological, 69 physical and sexual abuse, um, and 8.1% reported witnessing domestic violence. Um, and in line with previous research and the ACE literature specifically, all child abuse types in our study were found to be significantly associated with each other. Um, there was the strongest association between um, psychological abuse and physical abuse. So in other words, there was the highest odds of the two of those types occurring together. Um, and the weakest association um, or lowest odds um, of sexual abuse and witnessing domestic violence occurring together. Um, just briefly, some of the associated socio-demographics um, with um, experiencing childhood abuse. So females were more likely than males to have experienced at least one type, um, and were also more likely to report psychological sexual abuse and witnessing domestic violence. Um, there was also a significant association between each individual type of abuse and abuse count with age, um, the youngest age group having the lowest prevalence across all um, abuse categories. Then interestingly, the relationship between deprivation and prevalence of abuse differed by abuse type. Um, so there was a higher prevalence of psychological abuse and witnessing domestic violence among the more deprived quintiles. Um, but the prevalence of child sexual abuse was higher amongst the least deprived quintiles compared to the most deprived. Um, Child abuse count was also significantly associated with deprivation, with higher levels of deprivation associated with higher prevalence of multiple forms of abuse. Um, I didn't understand that. Sorry. Um, but overall, the differences between deprivation levels were relatively small, um, and abuse was prevalent across all uh, quintiles of deprivation. Um, in terms of ethnicity, there's also significant associations across all categories, with white respondents more likely to report um, abuse types um, than, non -white, than other ethnicities. Um, in our sample, the proportion of adults who experienced each um, adulthood violence victimization is presented here, so around 19% having experienced into a partner violence in their lifetime, 13% sexual violence, um, and 2.4% phys uh, physical assault in the past year. Okay, so we then looked at the association between the number of types of child abuse experienced and violence victimization in adulthood. Um, so this is the prevalence of each type of uh, violence victimization in adulthood um, amongst those who experience no childhood abuse. Um, we then see an increase in prevalence across each type um, for those who have experienced one type of abuse. Um, but experiencing multiple types of abuse associated with the highest prevalence of each form um, of violence victimization in adulthood. Um, so then we controlled for age, sex, ethnicity and deprivation um, and compared to individuals with no childhood abuse, um, those who had experienced a single type were 3.3 times more likely to experience into a partner violence since age 16. 
and 6.4 times more likely um, to have experienced intimate partner violence if they've experienced multiple types of child abuse. Similarly, for um, sexual violence, so again, after controlling for sociodemographics and compared to individuals with no childhood abuse, those who experienced one type were 3.6 times more likely uh, to experience sexual violence as an adult and 6.9 times more likely to experience sexual violence if they'd experienced multiple types of abuse in childhood. Um, in terms of physical assault for the past year, um, 2.2 times more likely to have experienced a physical assault if you'd experienced one type of child abuse, um, and up to 3.4 times more likely if you'd experienced multiple types of abuse. So a similar kind of um, dose response relationship that as was seen in the previous um, ACE studies. Um, so in bivariate analysis, the prevalence of each adulthood violence outcome was higher amongst individuals who had experienced each type of abuse compared to those who had not experienced that type. Um, but even after controlling for sociodemographics, each individual type of abuse was significantly associated with all of the violence outcomes. Um, so if we just think back to that previous literature, um, our body of literature, which used to look at each of these types in isolation as a predictor for one of these forms of victimization as an adult, um, that may be wrongly attributing risk to just one type of abuse, because all of them are in fact um, associated um, with violence, the three violence victimization variables. Um, we then looked at what would happen if you entered all abuse types into the same regression and controlled for sociodemographics. Um, so when all individual types um, were entered simultaneously into the model, um, relationships or odds ratios were slightly lessened, um, but the majority of individual types remained independently associated um, with increased odds um, of the three violence um, adult outcomes. And then finally, in the last model, we added child abuse count into the model along with all of those individual types of abuse to see if individual types of abuse were still predictive of adult violence outcomes after we accounted for the fact of whether someone was um, a victim of multiple types or not. Um, and we actually found that each in adulthood violence um, type was associated with different types of child abuse. Um, so intimate partner violence, after accounting for whether someone had experienced multi-form multi victimization, um, intimate partner violence um, remained associated with psychological and physical abuse. Sexual violence remained associated with psychological and sexual abuse. Um, and physical assault was associated with psychological abuse only. Um, so just consistent with early research, examining the types of abuse individually shows that all types are significantly associated with each of the three adult violence outcomes in the current study. Um, and crucially, but consistent with more recent research, um, our findings also show that correlation and co-occurrence of abuse types. Um, and that provides evidence that multiple types of abuse should really be considered in both research and practice. And so studies that just look at a single form of, of abuse um, could be kind of er erroneously attributing that increased risk of re-victimization as the unique impact of just that one type um, of abuse under study. And we also saw that when all individual types of abuse were considered together in the current study, um, most relationships with uh, adult violence outcomes were slightly lessened, but they remain significant. Um, and this suggests that child abuse in general, regardless of what type you experience, does increase the risk um, of re-victimization as an adult. Um, and then consistent with the ACE literature, um, the current study also demonstrated that cumulative impact um, of child abuse on risk of violence re-victimization. So whilst most abuse types were independently related um, to physical assault, into a partner violence and sexual violence, the strongest predictor of each adult violence outcome was experiencing multiple types of abuse in childhood. And then while abuse in general, regardless of type, was associated with increased risk of re-victimization, particularly for those individuals, as I said, who experienced multiple types of abuse, um, the current study did expand on previous research on re-victimization by demonstrating that when you control for the effects of whether you've experienced multiple types, um, the type of abuse is still predictive of adult violence outcomes. And so it suggests that um, the effects of particular combinations of different types of abuse may be obscured 
um, in the sort of ACE literature when each type is given an equal weight and they just use that count um, approach. Um, so kind of crucially, both the type of abuse and the number of types experienced seem to be important um, and should be something that is considered um, in future research. Um, and just to finish to say that interpersonal violence is really one of the most preventable causes of premature um, morbidity and mortality and it's obviously a key target of sustainable development goals. Um, and evidence from our study suggests um, that preventing um, child abuse will also have that downstream in effect of preventing interpersonal violence across the life course. Um, and adult health violence victimization is likely to kind of add to the trauma or compound effects of childhood abuse. Um, and so this kind of makes the case for focusing on um, public health efforts on preventing childhood abuse and disrupting those intergenerational um, cycles of violence. Thank you very much.